Cricket, the game of glorious uncertainty, they say. It's considered the birthright of the West Indian people. And the West Indies team was a dominant force to reckon with in the 70s and 80s. What was it like as a player in that team? And what did it take to be in that team? My guest is a former West Indies cricketer from those glory days. He was regarded as one of the best fielders in his time. Roger Harper is our guest on the Ghana Chronicles personality profile. Ghana, third man out this morning. Pocock goes. Caught Ghana, bold Harper. Roger, welcome to the Ghana Chronicles personality profile. Thanks, okay. I must say that it's delightful to have a Guyanese and West Indies cricket icon in the studio, and it's I'm excited about this. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Roger, West Indies cricket and all that you've achieved, but how did it all start? Where did it all start? And why cricket? Why cricket? Well, why not cricket? But um, I, from a very young age, you know, I was attracted to sport and in particular cricket. I grew up in a home where my father was a lover of sport and uh, my older brother, that's the one uh, before me, Mark. Mark, yes. You know, he's almost six years older than I am and he was very much a cricket lover, very much into cricket and you know, I followed him around. So that love for cricket in particular developed and blossomed from a very early age. Wow. And as a little boy growing up, were you the kind of little boy going around the place and you get a butt? Like, I know these little kids, you walk around, you see them, those passionate ones, they got a little stick in their hand and every bottle I see on the, on the road, playing, or, or they walk around with, without, with an imaginary butt, just playing shots, you know. Were you like that? I mean, the, what were well, you like? No, I don't kid? remember, recall walking on the road and doing that. But I was, uh, like I said, with my brother, who's a lot older, and my cousin, similar age to, my, to, to Mark. And uh, so I would follow them around, be playing a lot with them. But we played during the holidays when we couldn't actually leave the home until in the afternoon my mother came back from work. We would play in the house with uh, make balls out of socks and that sort of thing. Move all the furniture and the breakable things to one side and play in the home, then try and rearrange the home before my mother got back in and that sort of thing. So yeah, we found creative ways of playing the game. Actually, we made a table cricket game oh. where we, we used one of the beads from one of my mother's chains <laughs> and uh, we used a clothes clip as a bat and either the soldiers we had, those plastic figures we mm -hmm. had, you know, as toys or we used a domino or something as fielders. So we played test matches. That's strategy. You know, yeah, yeah. From early we were doing things like that, yeah. Wow. Um, if you were to credit one or two persons who were both instrumental and critical in you becoming a West Indies cricketer, who would that be? I think um, the main person would have to be my brother Mark. Mark. Yes, because uh, that, the love for the game, the inspiration, and a lot of the, my knowledge came from and through him from an early age, you know. And then um, there were a number of people at various stages that played critical roles. I think uh, my game's master at Queen's College, the later uh, Frank Maloney, you know, um, he sort of provided a lot of opportunities and always instilled the sort of discipline and ensure that the, the game was played in the right manner. And, um, you know, at my club, the Demara Cricket Club, a number of the players I played with at the time, senior to myself, you know, uh, William White, Keith Aaron, and a lot of those guys, those were the ones that sort of kept me focused and drove me on to become the sort of player and person that I am. Wonderful, but Roger, obviously there had to have been something that you were doing different from others, especially in, in, this, in, in certain disciplines that would have propelled you to become, other than being gifted and gifted athlete, there has to be something that you would have done um, that is different discipline-wise. What did it take 
you know, what were, the, what, were, what were the hours like, putting in all the hours, and what was it like working hard to become, to get to the next level and to ultimately play for the West Indies? Well, Akash, from very early I knew I wanted to become a professional cricketer. I think um, I was inspired by Sagafi Sobers, you know, mm -hmm. the greatest uh, cricketer. And, you know, at that time, he, his name was the one on everyone's lips. And um, so I decided that I wanted to become a professional cricketer at a very early age. I remember during uh, my common entrance class, um, we were given an essay to write on the school you wanted to attend. And of course, I wrote about Queen's College. And my um, class teacher, Mrs. Bradshaw, you know, when she read out the mark, she says, uh, Roger, this is an excellent essay. You topped the, the class, but I need to see you after uh, <laughs> school. <laughs> she said, this essay is brilliant. But that's the reason you want to go to Queen's College, because of the number of sports fields they have, the cricket pitches, the cricket grounds, and the badminton courts, and the table uh -huh. tennis facilities. And that is why you want to go to Queen's College. So she was impressed by the essay but not delighted by the reasons I give for wanting mm -hmm. to go to Queen's College. And then, um, you know, even at Queen's College, I had an English teacher called Mrs. Blake. And um, she once asked the class, uh, what careers do you want to pursue? What would you like to become? And I heard a lot of my classmates um, name some professions that I'd never even heard about, you know. You know, octarial scientists and <laughs> that sort of thing. I had to go and research that. But when I said I wanted to become a cricketer, Mrs. Blake was originally, is originally from Jamaica, right? And she spoke, you know, perfect English. But when I told her <laughs> that, she broke into Jamaica. She said, <laughs> boy, you come, to ja you come to Queen's College and you want to be a cricketer. <laughs> your mother know that, your father know that. You know, but she has, she has been one of my great biggest fans, you know, but uh, at the time, you know, I don't think she was very amused. But the point is that, you know, I knew what I wanted to, to become. And, you know, every step of the way, even though I didn't realize it at the time, I, once I was involved in the game, got the opportunity, I always worked at it, took it seriously, and paid a lot of attention and interest in it. And the fact that I was from an early age playing with older boys and men meant that, um, not just technically, but I think uh, mentally, my game was growing and I learned a lot more and grew as a player. So, you know, that is what helped to fast track me towards the, the higher level and becoming the international cricketer that I wanted to be. Brilliant. What would you say is your, was your toughest challenge having to, be, having to face as a youth in, in cricket and life as a whole? wanting to be a cricketer? That, that's, that's a difficult question because I, I don't really... Um, I think the fact that, you know, my mom wanted an academic, really. She saw me going to Queen's College and wanted a, a guy and a scholar. Yes. And um, like I said, I was focused on becoming a, you know, a professional cricketer. And getting past her was a, was, a, was a big challenge, but I think once she realized that I was determined to to pursue the cricketing avenue. She, she too supported me, so that was huge. But um, generally, I think I've been blessed along the way, you know, and um, I've had to work hard, but I didn't, I don't see, I didn't see myself having any real great challenges and hurdles to overcome that, um, you know, wouldn't be normal in any way. Um. Let's fast forward to Eden Garden, December 10th, 1983, the West Indies store of India. Um, your test debut, mm -hmm. the cap is here. Mm -hmm. uh, man, what did that feel like? And, and I'm going to read out the team just now, but what did it feel like? Well, that was an amazing feeling. You know, I can still uh, actually <laughs> vividly remember, you know, that occasion and the fact that it was like you said Eden Garden, Calcutta in those days you know 
the capacity was 120,000, and I think it was almost full. And to be playing in front of so many people, it was really a tremendous experience, you know. But um, one that I remember wow. to my grave, really. And for, for the viewers, I, I want to read out the, the, the team. Um, West Indies team, Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes, Viv Richards, Larry Gomes, Jeff Dujon, Ricky Keeper, Clive Lloyd as captain, Malcolm Marshall, Michael Holding, Roger Harper, Andy Roberts, and Winston Davis. On India side, it was Sunil Gavaskar, Gaykwad, Dilip Vensarkar, Mohinda Amanat, Ashok Malhotra, Ravi Shastri, Roger Bini, Kapil Devas captain, Said Kirmani was a wiki keeper, uh, Srivial, Srivlal Yadav, and Mahinder Singh. I heard this crazy story that when the Indians saw you that morning, standing at six feet five, <laughs> you know, they, they got together, they said, wait, 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 we got a face hold in. We got a face Roberts, Marshall, and Davis, and another tall fast bowler? Is, that, is, what's, is there some truth to that? Well, I think that might be a, a bit of a rumor because I, you know, I've been on the tour of India for a while prior to that point. So they would have seen me in the state games and that sort of thing. But I think a lot of people get that impression yeah. when they, they see my height, especially, you know, mm. it's a comparable height to the other fast bowlers of the time. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> Because I've heard this many times. I'm sure you have heard the story before, too. Yes, people make uh, that, those sort of remarks and that sort of um, comment to make light of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but back to the test match, you know, what was it like, man, you know, being on that field and working with these guys, you know, the first test match? <laughs> Just take us through some of the experiences. Well, first thing, being in the same dressing room with those guys, you know. Uh, it was a tremendous um, feeling and experience, but actually I had been uh, selected to a squad when West Indies played India in the Caribbean. They had, a, for the first test in Jamaica, uh, we, there was a training squad prior to the start of the test and the first test, and I was included in that squad. And so I had the opportunity to share a dressing room with them at the time. You know, I wasn't really picked in the test match, but, you know, just being around them, you know, rubbing shoulders with them, practicing with them, you know, was a tremendous experience. But on the tour of India, you know, that took things to another level. And um, every time, so Vivian, when he was Viv at the time, every time he spoke, I just couldn't help but looking around to take the words out of his mouth, you know. But, um, yeah, you know, being in the dressing room with a bunch of uh, greats and champions was a tremendous experience. Wow. Roger, there was something special about you in England. You really did shine brightly there. Your best test figures in bowling, you were in, it was in England, in uh, 6 for 57 in 1984. Mm -hmm. Then you made your highest test score of 74 at Old Trafford. Mm -hmm. Four years later, what is it about in England and you, man? Well, <laughs> I don't know. It's a good point, yes. But I had a lot more opportunities against England. But I was very familiar with conditions in England as well. I haven't played a lot of, I uh, haven't played county cricket, haven't played league cricket as well. But um, yes, I, I sort of had a bit of a liking to the England setup and the English team, so to speak, in terms of performance. But um, Old Trafford is, is my favorite ground, you know, one of my favorite international grounds uh, because of the fact that, you know, I've always seemed to done, have done well there. Wow. Look, Roger Harper's name will forever be etched into the annals of cricketing history because of a moment of pure brilliance. When you ran out, Graham Gooch, he was on 117 uh, at Lords in 1987. It was the 200th match of the MCC coming up against a World Eleven that you played for. The names of, of, of those two teams are, the, are, are is the stuff of legend, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to I read those names before I get back to this. It was um, the World Eleven team was Sunil Gavaskar, Desmond Haynes, Dilip Vensakar, Alan Border, Jeff Dujon, 
Imran Khan, Kapil Dev, Roger Harper, Courtney Walsh, Javed Miandad, and Abdul Qadir. On the Melbourne side, it was Mike Gatting as captain, um, Gordon Greenwich, Chris Broad, Graham Gooch, David Gower, Clive Rice, Richard Hadley, Ravi Shastri, John Embury, Malcolm Marshall, and Bruce French as wicket keeper. That, those names, man, is legendary. And you're there with, you're, I mean, you're a legend yourself, but to be there with those men playing in that bicentenary game must have been something else. Yes, it was. It was, again, you know, sharing a dressing room with all those greats from different parts of the world, being able to share ideas, pick their brains and discuss different aspects of the sport and hear how they think, you know, mm. it was really interesting, yes. At the time when it happened, the commentator said, um, you will never see another piece of, well, a piece of more brilliant bowling that you, uh, um, feeling that you've just seen. You ran in, you bowled, and don't let me talk about you. Take, take me through that. What, what was the, what would happen that moment? Well, um, one of the things about being a good fielder is being able to anticipate. And one of the advantages of bowling as well as I knew exactly where the ball, the type of delivery I'd bowled, and what options the batsman had. So I was a fraction of a second. As he started to move down the track, I anticipated you know, what was likely to happen and was looking for the ball in that direction. So he hit it and he hit it he straight, drove it firmly just on the onside of the wicket, but I was heading there already. So when I got my hand on the ball, he was still, his momentum was still bringing him down the track. So once I picked it up, you know, uh, he didn't have much of a chance. As I picked it up and threw it back and hit the stump, the best he tried to do was get his body in the way of the throw, which would have been very interesting if the ball had hit him, really. But I must say, that is not the first time that I have executed a run-out like that. I mean, uh, former assistant, um, former super, assistant superintendent, um, Glasgow, mm -hmm. I think he, yes, of the police force. I mean, I, I run him out in similar fashion playing case cup cricket at, uh, at Eve Larry. So, you know, it's not the first time that I've done something like that. But um, yes, it was a tremendous uh, moment, I think, and I think it's something that um, a lot of people had seen for the first time. So. Roger Harper is coming on. Well, a brilliant piece of feeling there. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, Goose two yards out of his ground playing the shot and no chance of getting back. Hit the stumps on the return. You won't see a better piece of feeling than that. Ever, I don't think. Magnificent. It's, and it's that presence of mind, you know, that you have to be thinking ahead of the game all, at all times, isn't it? Well, I think when you're in the field, whether you're bowling or you're actually feeling, you have to think of yourself as a wicket taker. And I think bowling, you have a double opportunity. And like I said, you know, um, I sort of anticipated the options the batsman had, what he was likely to do. And the moment he struck it in my direction, I knew there was an opportunity to take a wicket with a run on. In all the cricket that you've played, what, is your, what would you say is your most memorable moment? In, in cricket, Roger? Um, that varies and has changed from time to time. But I think um, one of the, the things I'm most proud of is that 6 for 50, 56, I think it was at Old Trafford in 1984. Because yeah. um, I think bowling, not often I had the opportunity to bowl very long spells. And, you know, bowling uh, amongst the, the greats of Marshall, Garner, Holding, and to be able to take uh, six wickets, I think I see that as you know, a significant and major achievement. And I was particularly proud of that. Wow. Roger, cricket has obviously given you a lot. How would you like to give back? Well, um, you're very right. Cricket has given me quite a lot, almost everything. You know, I owe a lot to the sport. And I'm always uh, very appreciative of what I've achieved through the sport and because of the sport. It's taken me to several corners of the world, and I've met a lot of you know, very important people. But um, I always try to remember, never forget where I came from, through 
school, Queen's College, and especially at my club. And now I serve my, I serve my club as the president of the cricket club, of the, of the Demerara Cricket Club. And um, we, I see opportunity to give back by helping to create and facilitate opportunities for the young fellows to be able to achieve, you know, more than I have achieved. You know, get them to understand uh, what it's going to take, what is required, and make sure that we facilitate that development and, and progression. Also, I serve and have served as um, president of the Georgian Cricket Association for 10 years and now as a vice president. So again, we're creating opportunities for the youths in Georgetown and um, to, to, to play competitive cricket and showcase their skills. When, when I came there to, to visit you at the Demerara Cricket Club uh, two weeks ago, you were there working with kids. Some of them look like six or, or five or six all the way into, into their early teens and there was a camp going on there and they were, I s s stayed there for a while and I looked at these kids and the passion that they were approaching this game with, um, is, is, this where it, is this where it has to start, Roger? That's where, you have to start young, that's the thing. You see, I was very fortunate in that I grew up in a time when a lot of cricket was played in schools, at primary school, you know, you had cricket, you had teachers who had a tremendous passion and interest in the game and spent time, you know, with PE classes, uh, taking us through uh, cricket matches with softballs and getting us to understand the, the fundamentals of the game. And then at, at high school, when I went to Queen's College, I played so much cricket there. The field was always in pristine condition. You know, we had motorized rollers and that sort of thing. And you know, all the three grounds were always, there's always cricket matches on Saturdays. We played into house cricket, into farm cricket, white cup cricket, North Court cricket. So, you know, a lot of cricket was played in schools. And I would really like to see us go back to those days where, you know, we start our breeding ground for sport in general, right, in our schools and not sport just being, you know, something by the way. Mm -hmm. I think that we so often forget the opportunities provided by sport and I don't think enough of this is explained to our youths. I think that um, when I look at the Jamaican athletes in particular and the, mom, the number of them that, that go abroad on sporting scholarship, athletic scholarships, but end up pursuing a career in academics because they use the sport as the vehicle to get to university. And I don't think we quite um, appreciate the opportunities provided by that. And, um, you know, female footballers, for example, there are a lot of opportunities for scholarships for our youth. But um, coming back to the question, we have to create opportunities and try and develop uh, our, our, our youth from very early, give them the opportunity to play and, and learn the fundamentals of the game. And the camp we had at Demara Cricket Club over the last two weeks is part of that process. It's an annual camp, and we have kids ranging from uh, eight years old to under 19, right? And um, yes, we were very worried this year because actually it's the first time for a while that we've been able to use the field. Usually at that time, the weather is bad. Mm -hmm. And the Ministry of Sport has been accommodating to us. They've loaned us the they would lend us the gymnasium to, you know, to run the camp. But this year, we had fantastic weather, and we were a little concerned about the heat. But man, I think instead of the, the kids being worried about the sun, I think the sun was worried about them, <laughs> because they weren't bothered. They were, at lunchtime when they should be resting, they were out there playing, you know. And they, they had a ball, but I think they, they enjoyed it, and they would have learned a lot. I did see the excitement and exuberance that was shown by these kids. Mm. Um, and this leads, us, this leads us into the other question I'm going to ask you, Roger. And let me share my own, my own side of how I see things. Look, I love, I loved cricket. I, I, say, I still love cricket. And I was, a, I was a diehard West Indian fan. But it's sad to say that my passion for the game is not the same because the team that I love so much has not been doing as you know, when I started following cricket in the in the nineties, look, I'm not going to stir a controversy, 
But in April 2018, I wrote an article um, titled, and it will be found on the web, it's titled, The Pain of a Hopeful West Indian Fan. The Pain of a Hopeful, hopeful West Indies Cricket Fan. And that was when the West Indies barely made it into the 2019 World Cup. 2023, and we're not even there. Roger, what has to be changed? Um, that, I think, is a separate <laughs> program by itself. But uh, what I would say is this. I think we often look at West Indies cricket and the players we just see on television. But I think we have to look at the whole process of developing our players. And I, I agree. From a, a skill perspective, straight skill perspective, I don't think there is much different. And these are the physical skills, huh? the technical skills. I don't think there is as tremendous a difference between our players and the rest of the world. I think most of it is in terms of our mental skills, our ability to to adapt to different conditions, our ability to think through situations, our ability to, to apply ourselves for long challenges, you know. I don't think that we, you know, we concentrate well for, for long enough, often enough for long periods, and that we withstand pressure well. And I think uh, the way the older folk were, or folks in the past were brought up, inculcated a lot of those qualities. So, you know, so it was easier to develop it in a sporting environment. But now I think we have to try and inculcate those qualities in our young sportsmen and then develop it further. As well, of course, as working and enhancing all the technical skills you know, and, uh, that, that we need to see at the international level. But too often we just pay attention to what is happening at the international level and not what is happening uh, at the foundation level. The other thing is this is that uh, T20 cricket has, co have, uh, has come along. You see, the, a great point is that we learn to play the longer version where you develop that mentality and that mind to apply yourself and de learn your technique and build it. Now, because of this T20 craze, people are learning to play the short version mm -hmm. where a lot of the fundamentals are short-circuited, so to speak. So, and uh, people are focused on, you know, getting the quick cash, so to speak, without really building the, the, the sort of structure and, fun, and, uh, and functions and fundamentals that is required to play the game long term, especially, you know, in, in the longer versions. That's why sometimes we succeed more at the shortest version, the 20 overs, not, and the 50 overs we have challenges, and the test matches often we have challenges as well. So, we have to look at that, and the thing about it is that years ago, territories played a tremendous role in developing the individual players. Now everything is thrown on the West Indies Cricket Board. When the, when the players got to the international level of the West Indies Board, they were already of a particular quality and standard, you know, and they, they, they came with a lot of intestinal fortitude, so to speak. Now that is not the case, and we have to get back to that situation where the, the players are developed and honed to a, a greater standard by the territories themselves. As you said, we might have to have another program to go into the fundamentals and, and dive deep into what has to be done. But um, I want to close off this interview on a really, on a really high note. I played a, little, I played a lot of tape ball cricket in, in my time, a few hardball every now and then. Um, actually, I was a captain for the Chronicle team. We've never lost a game. Perhaps it was astute captaincy or combination of that and the talent of the Chronicle players. And I, and I was a leg spinner. I, I really did rip it a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to bowl six deliveries to you. And you have 60 seconds to answer those questions in the form of what I'm going to show it to you. It may, it, may, it may be a bit deceptive and go the other way at times. Just watch out for it. Um, toughest bowler you ever faced? Toughest bowler I ever faced, I would say, Abdul Qadir. Abdul Qadir. Um, best batsman you ever bowled to? International batsman, Sonal Gavaskar. Um, closest teammate? Closest teammate, uh, Courtney Wall. 
modern cricketer you admire the most? Uh, Virat Kohli. You, got, you still got 60 seconds. Tell me why. Well, uh, his work ethic and um, his application to his craft and dedication to his craft and the fact that, you know, even at the very top of his game, he still continues to work hard and still strives to be the best. He might not be producing as he, as he was years ago, but he's still striving. Best moment of your international, uh, of your career, locally, internationally, uh, best moment? Uh, that's 6 for 56 against uh, England for 1984. You did say. And your greatest all-time all cricketer? Uh, would have to be Sagafi Sobers. And that's my six to you. Well, Akash, you know, well bold. <laughs> thank you so much. Roger, it is, an, you know, it's, I want to thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to have had you here. Um, and I hope we can do this again. I hope you can come back soon. Um, let's talk cricket. It's the, as I said in my intro, I believe that cricket is the birthright of the West Indian people. And we should really own it. Sometimes you lose things. But you, once it's yours, you can reclaim it. And I believe that we have to. We have to start somewhere. And if doing things like this is where it starts, then we're on the right track. So thank you so much again, Roger. Pleasure, Akka. Brilliant. Thank you. Viewers, thank you so much for joining us on the Ghana Chronicles Personality Profile. It was a brilliant inning by Roger Harper. Remember to click, like, and follow our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until I see you again in two weeks, cheers for now.